I'd like to now start with the, with the panel discussion. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Hanamle, how do you view a work like this? What is its place in, uh, uh, given the current historiography, which is selective? Uh... Uh, Sudha, madam, uh, thank you so much. Uh, many congratulations to Vikram ji. Uh, the reason is not just a writer, not just an author, ma'am. If you look at this canvas, the, the quality of books he has written, music, uh, we just explained. To Veer Savarkar is a very deep book, madam. It's a very deep book. The, uh, both the parts you read it, it's not very easy one to read. A kind of research he has done. And uh, now this book. I am simply amazed how a writer can jump from one genre to other. <laughs> Uh, from the Mysore, uh, the Royal Palace, uh, to Veena, to biography of Balachandra ji. Then he went all the way to Veet Savarkar's story. <laughs> now the Brehavats of Bharat. This is something, we are, we are sitting somewhere near a very special person. Not a, not a very, people write books. People write a simple lineage of books. But this is a very special kind of writing. A very high quality writing. That's how, when I read the book, like you said, cover to cover, he was kind enough to send a book. He was insisting that I should read it before coming. <laughs> How can somebody s jump from one genre to other? That's the first question I had. Second, ma'am, uh, the big uh, G very clearly says, mm. I don't know, he has taken it as a habit, uh, last three, four books, to take on a biased narrative to correct it. This is not a very easy thing to do. And especially I know when last time the book, uh, Veet Savarkarji's book we are releasing in Chennai, the same day he got... Uh, his father has called me before I was coming to the stage. Uh, got admission to the Royal uh, Historical Society. He got admission there. Then all hell broke loose after that. Uh, the, all the writers, because for 70 years they were having a very unhindered uh, way of life. They all joined at one end, started picking up the book, started writing this, that and everything. That is the time I felt very happy also. Historians like Vikram Sambat were put in national map, global map, right after that instant has happened. They were put in the global map. They were put in the national map. This kind of writers trying to correct a historical narrative. Now, these are all stories in Tamil Nadu textbook, what he has covered about Raja Indra Cholan, Raja Raja Cholan, and Vilaniya Chayarji. It is all half paragraph story. Mm. When I go back to my uh, school reading, it is all half para, maximum one page. Yes. We struggled ourselves in the celebration of the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, 75th year of independence. We visited all the places, at least in Tamil Nadu, what Vikramji has mentioned. Very biased narrative, not very clear, uh, ideologically coherent piece of writing. People have written their own things in mind. So he's trying to correct it. It's not a very easy thing, not a simple book writing. He's taking on forces, trying to set things right. <laughs> And it will be appreciated. Even Veer Savakarji's thing, when I was uh, talking in the stage, I mentioned the book's quality, people will talk after 20 years, after yes. 25 years. Some books are meant like that. <laughs> uh, like an old wine, it ages, uh, it becomes special with time. So now, maybe this book right now, I was told it's already a national bestseller. Mm. We are not even releasing the book in Chennai. It is already fourth print. One print over, two print over, third print over. It is already in fourth print. This is doing a massive success, madam. Yesterday in uh, Coimbatore airport, I saw Chennai airport. I, I keep observing where the books are there. Everywhere people are buying. Somebody in Chennai brought it, madam. Special book written by a special person. I don't know, yesterday, make, made it an international habit to take on forces. This book I enjoyed very much because it is very simple in writing. Mm. It's a very easy read. As Avarkar is something I felt very deeply connected. I took a lot of time to read it. Mm. But this was a very straight through easy reading. But very enjoyable reading. Oh, correct. I, I, I saw in this book. I saw in that book. He's connecting. He's giving a new perspective. That's how I saw this book, madam. Thank you. Yes, uh, you're very right, uh, Mr. Anamle. Uh, Vikram is indeed a very, very versatile uh, uh, writer. And uh, the kind of research that he puts in, uh, I'm going to ask him about it later. Uh, that uh, the research which informs his work is what makes him produce such uh, uh, masterpieces, and he deserves all the uh, credit. <laughs> I have a question for you, Vikram. Now you have uh, in this uh, book covered. Uh, you've uh, profiled a pan-Indian uh, uh, list of uh, le uh, leaders from every. Uh, so, uh, 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 part of uh, India, starting from uh, 
Lalit uh, Aditya of uh, Kashmir, uh, Lachit uh, Bafur Khan, Assam, then uh, uh, Manipur, uh, uh, Bhagi Chandra, and then down south you have Martha Andavarma, Raja Raja Soran, and then uh, in the uh, Velunachiar, and also in the west you have uh, Kanoji Angre and uh, others. And the most heartening thing is that you have seven women, uh, <laughs> women out of the 15. I'm glad that we, they didn't have to ask for reservation to be uh, you know, featured in a book because it's, it's not happening in other. So, so the, was this uh, shortlist, did it happen by accident or was it a conscious, how did you arrive at this? Thank you, Sudhaji. Uh, very good evening to everyone. Uh, it's indeed a very, very special moment uh, for me to be in Chennai every time. It's my paternal home, my father's hometown. So uh, the feeling of warmth uh, that I come here every time, that's always very, very striking. And every time to have the uh, support and blessings of someone like Sri Anna Malai, who I think is, <laughs> we are fortunate to be in the times and actually witness a dharmic and an Indic renaissance happening in Tamil Nadu in his, under his leadership. Uh, if there is any hope, uh, there's any beacon of hope as the uh, person who introduced said, I think uh, he's sitting right here and for us to be in that presence, I think is a great uh, you know, honor. Thank you, sir, for gracing this occasion. Um, Sudhaji, to your question, uh, I mean, just think of it, uh, in your growing up years, when you were taught about Indian history and the wars and battles that we as India and Indians fought, almost all the wars that you or your children or grandchildren remember by heart will be the ones where India or Indians lost, right? From the battle of Hydaspus with uh, Porus and Alexander down to the, the myth of that whole Aryan invasion theory that it starts from there perhaps. Then, uh, you know, the Arab invasion of Sindh. Everybody knows of uh, Mohammed bin Qasim and 712, how uh, he captured Sindh. Uh, we know about the battle of uh, Tarain uh, where Mohammed Ghori, uh, we, we've heard all about the 17 times Mohammed Ghazni came and invaded India. Uh, Ghori's uh, victory. We know about the battles of Panipat. We know about the battle of Lassi, Battle of Buxar, Anglo-Mysore Wars, Anglo-Maratha Wars, Anglo-Sikh Wars, go on naming one laundry list of all the battles where Bharatiyas lost, right? Uh, now today, one of the only pre-bronze civilizations which is still alive and kicking, uh, if, if we are still around, there must have been some battles we won also. Some amount of courage that we as Indians and as a civilization we uh, presented to the, all the invaders. So if that is the case, why did these stories of courage, these stories of resistance and valor, why did they disappear from our national consciousness? Why was our history or us made to feel that sense of self-loathing that we are a land of losers? Uh, history has a very, very important role. As you mentioned, uh, you know, most people don't take it seriously. Even I as a student, uh, I don't think I was a very uh, good student in history. Most history classes would mean kneeling down outside class because uh, I just couldn't memorize who succeeded whom and which battle was fought in which year. That's how by rote we are made to learn. But as you grow up, you realize that history is that mirror in which we can identify ourselves as a nation, as a civilization, as a people. Its role is very important. And the forces that Annamalai sir mentioned, they understand this. And that is why history is manipulated in such a way so that it conditions your mind. It makes you think this way that we are no-gooders. Uh, so that is one major, you know, uh, fault line, so to say, in Indian historiography, which in a very small, humble way, I've tried to address in this uh, book. The second issue is this whole Delhi centricity of our narrative. Uh, I mean, just yesterday, I was so irritated seeing the news channels. Some municipal elections in Delhi becomes national news, whereas our cities can go under flood, under deluge. Uh, my hometown, Bengaluru, does not have an elected council for the last two years. The national media doesn't bother about that or raise that issue. Assam can have flood. But a little JNU, somebody threw something on someone and that becomes the whole narrative of India. And this is not just about media, it's even in history. I mean, in the, uh, if you actually, uh, you know, I'd urge all of you to go to the NCRT website, all the textbooks are freely downloadable. If you just download and see the coverage 
that most parts of India get. The south of India is most neglected. Uh, the Cholas get a few lines. Uh, all the other dynasties, Shatavahanas, Rashtrakutas, Pallavas, Chalukyas, they all are just come in a map. They are just shown that this is where they ruled and this is the uh, region. The Marathas, the grand Marathas from whom the British actually took India and not from the Mughals, they probably get half a paragraph. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj, the, the greatest icon of this country, uh, you know, he, all the coverage that he receives in today's NCRT books is just a photograph. One photograph with a caption underneath saying, who is this person? So you imagine that a young child who is studying in CBSC, which is, I mean, the state syllabus may be different in each state, it may be different, but by and large, the, the central syllabus, this is all that a child is knowing about our, uh, our heroes and also about the different regions. The Northeast, how many of us, I mean, if, if I just do a random, uh, you know, uh, poll here and say, can we name two home rulers of Assam? I don't know, uh, does, would anyone have an idea who two homes do we know they were Ahoms, <laughs> that they, were, they ruled Assam for 600 years and ensured that Assam was never conquered by anybody. And it's thanks to, I think, this government and the government of Assam that today, Lachit Bar who uh, whose 400th birth anniversary was celebrated just a few weeks back, who defeated the mighty imperial army of Aurangzeb, one of the biggest armies that he sent under Raja Ram Singh of Jaipur, was pushed back and the uh, Mughals or anybody, Afghans, whoever came into Assam, they could never occupy by Assam. So where is Lachit Bar Pukan in anybody's imagination? Nobody knows. The Northeast, who are the people of Manipur, who are the rulers in Nagaland, Tripura. When we say history of India, I think uh, the history of India needs to snatch her narrative back from Delhi. Uh, you know, I have nothing against Delhi, it's a beautiful place. But then it should give a, you know, a more uh, inclusive uh, kind of a uh, you know approach to all regions of india all regions should be represented and that is how history is also a tool of national integration to ensure you now a young student who comes from manipur or assam to delhi uh, every road they see is a tughlaq road and a mughal uh, you know aurangzeb lane and this and that and in the books to their uh, region their rulers their heroes their culture has no representation in the books they read so what is the kind of uh, feeling that that person would have in the national capital of of India. So I think that was another important fault line to address. And the third one which I tried to address was what you mentioned, Sudhaji, about uh, history being only his story, where her story does not get the uh, due that it deserves. Uh, women and their contributions to India, her uh, uh, civilizational uh, story, seldom get the uh, you know importance that it does so that's why i tried to balance this out with the seven women in the uh, book so i've tried to cover almost all parts of uh, the country starting from the 7th century with Lalita Ditya Mukta Pida of the Karkota dynasty. I don't even know, I don't remember having read about Karkota dynasty or about Lalita Ditya Mukta Pida who was called the second Samudra Gupta and the second Alexander of India who had a mighty empire of Kashmir uh, almost covering uh, you know, more than half of the Indian subcontinent in the 7th century. Uh, from him on to Naiki Devi of Gujarat who defeated Mohammad Ghori uh, in 1178 to Lachit Borphukon in the east to all the four South Indian states, Rani Abbakka from my state of Karnataka, Martanda Varma, uh, the uh, Rajendra Cholan and Velu Nachiar and Rudrama Devi of Varangal uh, who is also featured. So I've tried to cover as many uh, ignored parts of the country and also bring these stories where these were tales of courage, of pushback, of resistance, that we were not sitting ducks all through our long march of uh, history, that everybody who came, we just you know, kept uh, covering, we were all disunited, we had the caste system, this is the usual narrative that is brought about, uh, and that we succumb to every uh, invasion, which is not true, which has no historical basis, and this is just a small attempt to bring some of these stories in the uh, mainstream. This is, in fact, to choose these, it was more of whom to leave out rather than whom to choose because there are so many unsung heroes and heroines. And I just hope, as I mentioned even in the prologue, that this book spurs many more scholars, many more historians to start picking up this entire aspect of bringing out the local stories, local uh, you know, heroes from different parts of India. Thank you very much, uh, Vikram. I think we need to thank you for uh, correcting the skewed uh, perception and um, uh, bringing to light
the contribution of these heroes and uh, sheroes. It's been very, very educative for a person like me to read uh, this book and get to know uh, of all these people. The reason why many people don't like history is, is the way the textbooks are written. And, um, and so there's no absolutely no incentive uh, to just memorize dates and names and uh, places. Mr. Anamle, I have a question for you. Now, uh, 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 there were seven exceptional women leaders uh, profiled in the book. And they were not just, uh, uh, you know, dummies or uh, fronts for anybody. They led from the front. They led uh, their uh, uh, forces into battle. They, they uh, negotiated terms. They, uh, they, they were extraordinary uh, role models. Now, um, several centuries later, and 75 years after independence, of course, we've had one woman prime minister, two presidents, and I think about 16 chief ministers. But on the ground, women chief ministers, but on the ground, still there is, uh, women have to fight for their place at the high table. There's a lot of uh, atrocities uh, perpetrated, gender violence is being perpetrated. And uh, uh, w whether you're educated, uneducated, rich, poor, women are treated patronizingly. So what is the real status of women in our country, according to you, at this point in time? Madam, just when uh, Vikramji was talking about, uh, out of the 15 Bravehearts selected, seven are women heroes uh, who are selected. I was just thinking when I was reading in my textbook or when I was growing up, we hardly had any woman heroes to look up to. We hardly had anybody. And it was a male-dominated society. Even now it is more, but slowly it is changing. But not to the way that we want society to change, not the rapid way which we wanted to change. You're looking at heroes, you're looking at sports stars, you're looking at cinema stars, you're looking everywhere. You see only the woman heroes, very, very limited scale here and there. Just put your, let us put ourselves in the shoes of a school-going uh, woman child. 7th class, 8th class, ninth class. So when, when a guy puts up posters of Sachin Tendulkar or somebody, a cinema star or a sports star or somebody, putting up at room daily watching and I want to be like him, what does a girl put up in the room? Or keep in the heart? I think that is very important. man. That is very important because the role models that uh, you show them where the girl child aspires to be of a similar nature, cultivates qualities, traits, and develop an attitude like that, and slowly come up. That is where we as a country, we have, we have failed, man. For a long time, for a long, long time, we have failed. I remember when I was uh, in US recently, I went to a park, it's a national park, uh, where uh, it's called the Muyur National Park near San Francisco. And the country itself is hardly 250 years old. But that national park is all women park where uh, the uh, people are there to take care of the national park. Uh, redwood trees, 2,000, 3,000 years old trees. But the way they have documented that story, the way everywhere they have kept a plague and there are uh, the park uh, employees waiting and guiding us, taking us around, I felt very small. A country of 250 years old, a small history they are preserving, the way they preserve, the way they document, the way they show us. That is one way. Any, any child who goes in, you will get that feeling that, okay, we should preserve nature and these are all 2,000, 3,000 year old redwood trees and people are bringing their small child and showing this how you should be. Now, when we don't document history in the first place and second, among the documented history when we don't have women heroes in the second place and what does a girl child look up to? For example, if you look at Rani Velina chair, which she has beautifully documented, she is 60 years before Rani Jansi, 60 years before. But possibly Rani Velinachar is the only, forget about woman king, madam, probably the only emperor, a king, who took on the mighty British, defeated them, and ruled later for 17 more years. <laughs> there is no other documented history in India where I have taken on East India Company, I have defeated them. They will always find a way through your back door, they come and stab you in the back. But this woman, she defeated them and ruled for 17 more years. And even when we look at Rani Jansibai, when we talk about valor and greatness and all those great things, but recently a part of history that fascinated me. Not only is she a brave woman, but after her husband's death, before the annexation happened, 
the kind of negotiation she did with the british before she took the sword very beautiful high quality negotiation skills rani jansi was doing with british arguing why you should not take my kingdom these are all the legal precedent these are all the legal rules very beautiful negotiation she did failed it she took a sword but this face at of ranchi rani jansi bhai is not there it is not that you have to take a sword at the drop of a hat she did everything possible within her hands nothing worked finally she was forced to take a sword but rani velanachi the only thing we to commemorate her is we have a trade now rani velanachi express now that is the only thing which after modi ji came we, he named that train that is the only thing that is running if you go to the places that he has mentioned here the places that he has beautifully documented you go there madam the place where rani velnachya's husband and and uh, gauri uh, ke, uh, the, uh, the the second wife of the king both got yeah, killed yeah. yes madam you will see a small granite block you will see some two street dogs lying in north and south fully dusty place and somebody would have locked it he would have gone somewhere because we had that problem and you search for that guy everywhere you find and open it no document nothing not even a single plague that is written a simple tamil they have written somewhere it is what it is nothing is documented how will somebody you I, let us imagine i take my daughter there i show no this is the place where 250 years back rani velnachar she defeated and nothing to show then from there kaliyar kovil again when we when we travel much deeper there it is not only the story of rani velnachar ma'am like vikram very beautifully captured it is also the story of kuili who comes from a scheduled caste community the arundhadir community who possibly the world's first suicide bomber yes. who went in when you are looking at samathuvam in tamil we talk we are looking at that point of time 250 years yeah rani velnachar and kuili then she had marudu sahodarars the greatest of men guarding her standing with her but when they were hanged what what was marudu's last request you can hang me i don't have a problem but don't ever destroy my temple whatever i've built so take my head put it in front of the temple so that you know this are all very small things in our history ma'am but this is an important thing because you bring quality you build quality into our children attitude fearlessness straight forward living honesty ethics and we are searching for heroes now the the heroes that we show them are invariably failing the sports stars are invariably failing there is one thing one here one there so which hero to show my wife and me we have a constant debate my son is 7 years now he has already got some big posters and all he puts in his school bag so we all know that hero's nature and all uh, whatever he wants as hero now we are struggling whom should we introduce as a hero to our child now they are the hero sitting here but not properly documented so to answer your question madam yes the country has to change the documentation has started this is a great thing that vikram ji has done with the right perspective that is why it has sold four editions in one month ma'am because i think i think the middle class families like us are hungry for heroes because not only do we read we teach our children this is what it is some of the books some of the stories here martha and varma when he, when he has mentioned about uh, the kerala king i find lot of similarity with shivaji veer shivaji the more we dig into it the more we read into all of this we simply find great emperors almost have a same quality he went and surrendered his whole kingdom before lord padmana swami padmanabha swami he is that i am ruling in your name what did lord, lord shivaji do he also went met his guru surrendered his uh, kingdom he said i am ruling in your name i am a beggar shivaji said i am a beggar and guruji you just give me back my land i am ruling in your name the orange came from there and now people saffron saffron it came from shivaji came from sacrifice so at the highest level when you have top ethics madam you surrender yourself to a larger purpose we see in king martanda varma we see in shivaji we see everywhere this is what our children need the most because nobody teaches them the concept of surrender it is take more get more eat more live more spend more because you, the generation is teaching them more 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 but but none of us are able to teach them live less live a life of less comfort live a life of more sacrifice so this book so moment i think we teach them you never know the next lady prime minister is somewhere hiding in a government school she is looking for that one inspiration she is looking for the one story they are somewhere hiding somewhere we are not able to find them but moment a history school teacher in her class she goes to the board she goes beyond her syllabus a school teacher beyond her syllabus after class hours half an hour 
let us uh, she will tell our school children half an hour we we'll learn we'll learn about india's greatest uh, queens and she will teach I, i hope and pray somebody is going to do that mm. reading this somebody is going to do that in a government school and which is going to produce possibly in india's next woman <laughs> prime minister or the president so till then it's a constant process madam we just have to fight it out write it write it write it chisel it out so that the change starts happening thank you ma'am <laughs> thank you uh, mr namle i think you've made some very valuable uh, uh, comments and suggestions for how we should showcase uh, these uh, role models uh, talk about them preserve all the uh, the historical monuments uh, related to them and uh, um, uh, teach use this as a books like these as a teaching to, uh, tool to inspire the younger generation Vikram, in this uh, context, I want to ask you: uh, Were you, uh, when you were working on this book, I know the amount of research that would have gone in uh, to this book. Did you have uh, enough information that you wanted? What were the challenges? Where is, was it easy to research some of the subjects? I know it's not just uh, Google search or Wikipedia kind of uh, research. This is this is a research of you know uh, uh, top uh, quality and fact checking and yeah. so how did you what was a give us a sense of uh, yeah in fact my publisher penguin i often say they conned me into this book they said after that very bulky savarkar volumes do a quick quicky as my editor said uh, quickly you can put 15 stories it will be a fast read i said okay let me take a try because i have a bigger biography coming up which is of tipu sultan uh, <laughs> sucker for punishment that i am <laughs> so i thought okay let me do this fast but then i realized it was 15 times tougher than that savarkar book because you had to go to so many different parts of india it was my own i, I think bharat darshan yatra uh, yatras are the flavor of the season these days so uh, so uh, where i met uh, went to different parts of india and actually so in mainstream uh, history there is no accounts of several of these heroes including i mean annamalai sir spoke about uh, rani lakshmi bai her counterpart at the same time begum hazrat mahal who probably gave a very very strong resistance in lucknow to the british uh, you know in 1857 so little is known about her even in lucknow unfortunately um, so uh, but then you know constantly we are told that right from the time you know albaruni came and or the british came that the the hindus or the indians do not have an idea of history and documentation which is utterly false i mean if you go to kashmir kalhana and the rajatarangini that he wrote which i have uh, uh, you know uh, accessed um, um, in uh, detail for the chapter on lalita ditya has the entire story of the kashmir the the hindu past of kashmir uh, before the 13th century and the shahmiri dynasty coming there and taking over uh, so so this is documented history you go down uh, i mean in tamil nadu i mean the cholas managed to maintain their documents in the most beautiful manner uh, in multiple uh, copies of the same whether it was on temple inscriptions it was coins it was palm leaf manuscripts it was different sources similarly you go to northeast it from the 4th century bc onwards there is documented history of assam uh, you know and from the ahoms rulers who came in 1228 ce from then onwards what are known as the burunjis uh, these were the chronicles in the ahomia language which uh, very detailed catalogs the entire history of that place history of all the rulers so it's not as if there is no documentation it may not be in the way that the westerners look at how we need to document and keep our records we uh, in india has never followed any rule book we have our own unique uh, you know approach to life our own unique philosophy to everything about ourselves so we documented it in the way we want it's up to us to access it and uh, so uh, the sources then become multifold uh, you know looking at all these different uh, sources beyond textual references certainly beyond only the english and the mainstream uh, you know works that are there uh, 
and a lot of oral and uh, you know folklore uh, uh, the the story of the mardu brothers the the story of velu nachiar itself is uh, and veera pandian uh, katta bomman all of this is a part of folklore which uh, also i managed to access and very interestingly i mean this is the time of the kantara and the whole movie which has created a sensation of this bhuta aradhane which is done in my uh, state of karnataka now other than just uh, you know um, gods and uh, spirits and so on they also invoke uh, kings and queens of the past so i was very fortunate to go to actually one such bhuta aradhane uh, performance where uh, that day it was told to me that uh, rani abbakka whom i uh, you know uh, catalog here uh, she was being invoked now so obviously the practitioner uh, had a lot of things to talk about abakka and what she did and so on so it becomes a modern historian's uh, conundrum how much of that to take uh, you know there's a lot of fantasy there's a lot of uh, uh, you know storytelling in the middle of that there is a kernel of truth also uh, you know which one needs to extract triangulate with facts with some amount of lit, uh, you know oral history written documentation and come out with a more uh, you know sober narrative and i think uh, sudha ji that has been the uh, you know in the prologue i write that the indic uh, you know uh, perspective to what historiography itself is there is a shloka that is attributed to kalhana dharmartha kama mokshanam upadesha samanvitam uh, katha yuktam puravrittam itihasam ta chakshmate uh, you know katha yuktam in the form of a storytelling manner puravrittam the narratives of the past are told in a story uh, form upadesha uh, samanvitam there has to be a didactic element there has to be some moral fabric for society what is uh, you know the moral component of it uh, it needs to inspire people and in the achievement of what in the four purusharthas of dharma artha kama and moksha that is then called itihasam ta chakshmate itihasa is also in sanskrit it, it thus happened itihasa so the our puranas the mahabharata and the ramayana which are collectively called itihasas are all of this there is a lot of fantasy there are uh, mythical beings there is lot of uh, uh, you know even kalhana's rajatarangini has lot of uh, you know fanciful stories when lalita aditya went uh, to the dakshina patha the whole vindhya parvata itself uh, like a hunchback woman she uh, you know prostrated before him and gave way and made so all this fantastic tales are there but then in the middle of that the very fact that maybe he came towards the south on a campaign this is what might have happened so in the middle of this fantastic story is there is a kernel of truth and that is what a modern historian needs to draw out of i think for the longest time we have depended on the western model of what is known as the positivist theory of history which only looks at evidence based uh, you know everything needs to have evidence uh, but history is not a physical science it uh, the past by its very nature is not present and so you cannot really uh, in a lab you know put two chemicals and see what happens the, so whatever sources are there they are very very fragmented they are incomplete they are coming down through so many filters and very little of what is left that is what a modern historian needs to use to reconstruct the past and so uh, i think this indic perspective of what history needs to be uh, all of these uh, stories were written as kavyas so even our uh, sulba sutras that we talk of where we say the pythagoras theorem came from that if you go and see there nobody is saying a square equal to b square plus c square directly there is a maha kavya in that something is embedded so our uh, i think the people who were knowledge seekers in our civilization they didn't wanted to give the knowledge very easily to the seeker you have to work a little hard to extract that uh, truth out of it even if you go i mean a uh, shakta sadhaka uh, if you go to the uh, lalita trishati uh if you take the first uh, syllable of all the uh, mantras that are there if you join that you get the panchadashi uh, mantra which comes out but you need to know that to actually get that out it will not be told to you saying which is what the western model everything is spoon fed to you and given to you so i think this indian way of looking even at history it has never been given its due it has always been rubbished away right from the times of uh, invaders from as i said alburuni down to the british to the marxist historiographers who look down upon uh, you know the indian perspective of what history needs to be and i have tried my best to incorporate all these things written documentation oral narratives uh, folk uh, performances and also other sources like manuscripts inscriptions coins everything to try and reconstruct a semblance of the past
I think that that gives us a sense of the magnitude of the task, um, separating fact from fiction, like you said, um, uh, deciding what to keep, what not to keep. And this thing about moral, uh, that, that message being there. I think even Mr. Namle mentioned that, you know, uh, we need to change the way we look look at uh, uh, the, the kings looking at uh, his kingdom as an offering to the, to the deity he worshipped. It's not something that he took uh, as belonging to, to himself. So I think that that is where we are going wrong. There is just no... Uh, 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 people are not acting with a certain conscience. There is no moral compass. Anything is all right. As long as I uh, get what I want, it doesn't matter how I get there. I think we need to correct all of this and uh, uh, that will make us a better society. So that's why I feel that a book like this should be taken to schools, to, to across uh, dem demographics, to, to, to be taught to groups of people. Of course, storytellers and filmmakers will draw from the book. One but thing I would like to add, Sudhaji, to what you said. Uh, another th aspect which I forgot about, you know, uh, in the Indic con uh, consciousness or imagination of what a Digvijaya campaign is, uh, you know, uh, Lalita Ditya goes on a Digvijaya, uh, Raja Raja Choda goes on a Digvijaya campaign, but so also Adi Shankaracharya also goes on a Digvijaya campaign. He is not a ruler, he is not a politician, but the idea of Digvijaya itself to mean not just material conquest, but also intellectual, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, not defeating someone, but uh, making another person accept your point of view through debate, discussion, dissent, differences of opinion. You hammer that out through uh, vada and sambada Dialogue. and vivadas uh, that come there. So uh, even Lalita Ditya, when he goes on this massive campaign across India, uh, conquers, as I said, almost whole of uh, half of the Indian subcontinent is the Kashmir Empire. Uh, he doesn't stop just there or building magnificent cities or building great palaces and temples, which he does. But he also makes Kashmir a center of great learning, a center of intellect. And wherever he goes and captures any ruler, uh, from that particular place, the, the, the idol is brought back and established in a much bigger temple than what the opponent had. Uh, and also the scholars from that uh, court they would be brought back and made in the Navaratnas of your court. Mm -hmm. And that is one reason why, you know, Kashmir, uh, so people like Vakpati, uh, Atri Gupta, uh, who was Abhinav Gupta's grandfather, Bhavabhuti, the Sanskrit poet, then Charvaka, Shushruta, all these people were in the Kashmir, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem. And so uh, you had Kashmir becoming a center of the uh, Tantra, of Kashmir Shaivism. Atri Gupta was the grandfather of Abhinava Gupta, who uh, is credited with Kashmir Shaivism, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, which flourished there, uh, also astrology, astronomy, all these different... Uh, so the index of your kingdom was not just how many palaces you built or the material conquest, but on the scholarly level, on the intellect, intellectual. Uh, intellectual capital, how good was your kingdom vis-a-vis -vis another one? And that we see all through, I mean, the Vijayanagar Empire, you have so many stories of contests between, mm. uh, you know, a scholar comes to your court and says, we would, uh, the entire honor of that kingdom is at stake, uh, you know, if uh, uh, the uh, resident scholar is defeated. So I think that is very important and that is what we have lost touch with, only in the pursuit of materialism, mm -hmm. this intellectual component and the finer aesthetics of life, yes. I think that is not there, then all the wealth, all the uh, material benefits, um, I think will be much poorer. That is really the need of the hour, Vikram. So, so uh, uh, any plans on taking this across uh, to schools? I, I yeah. <laughs> I know, I know that universities will uh, take, uh, you know, recommend uh, this book uh, uh, as a reading material. History departments, of course, they will. I'm very unsure of that. <laughs> <laughs> universities and the two history not, departments, not, well, not in India, maybe the West. Outside, all the more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you uh, uh, propose any any uh, suggestions from you? Would be valuable, Mr. Namle. Um. Uh, before the era of technology, I, uh, it was being controlled who will read what, who will see what, who will hear what. That yes. was the, the controlled mechanism. Mm -hmm. I think this book and uh, other kinds of books, uh, I believe children read 
children get knowledge maybe 20% from what they get in school 80% <laughs> is outside that is my way of looking yes. at uh, school education now madam so it's a matter of time before kids will start uh, picking it up many things recently for the azadi ka amrit mahotsav the doordarshan came up with 75 excellent stories throughout the year which will be a proper high quality hd video i mean a 45 minute video of a one historical person of india some of uh, tamil nadu's greatest people are also chronicle there people who lived 200 years back 250 years back proper historical 4d narration but this kind of things something should come about this book also this book is a classic case of uh, a netflix uh, <laughs> netflix one uh, you have 15 stories you have uh, like a game of thrones model you can make it and uh, because the content consumption is, is is also to be debated and discussed ma'am this is a book and now the younger generation reading if you look at this thing if you look at uh, the evening function how many kids are here some of the greatest uh, carnatic musicians are here sitting in the front, front row there i have some politician sitting i have some young upsc preparation people sitting then we have some eminent gentlemen some doctors sports sports people from chennai now if you look at the kids per se uh, people would like to see a video people mm. won't like to see a narration but for that to happen a book is a must yeah so i i'm sure vikram is not expecting this books to sell about 10 million copies mm. it should be 10 million copies every child in india should read it but he hopes and pray maybe somebody when they read the book would get an idea to develop a movie by line or a netflix series by line from there it will reach a lot of people ma'am and more than that it is very important that we take our children outside i remember when i was uh, in chikmangalore uh, in karnataka as the sp of the district one day i went to a police station for inspection uh, there is a taluk called tarikere and there is a police sta- and there is a small town called amrit amriteshwara amrithahalli sorry long time seven eight years now when i went to the amrithahalli police station i asked the inspector why did you get the name called amrithahalli he said i don't know sir then i asked couple of officers who were inside can somebody tell me why the name has come then one guy had a smart idea he said i'll go to the collector's office get the district gazetteer we will read it then within no time somebody went to collector's office got the gazetteer we opened it then we found the amrithahalli name came because there is a temple called amriteshwara there then the next question is why did amriteshwara temple got built then uh, we had time i said chalo we'll go see come so all of us went it's a very beautiful stunning temple 3 uh, 4 km away from the city built for lord shiva magnificent temple then all of us were wondering how did the temple come we called up the guide and two guides were able to mumble something he said there is a senior guide you should call him then we called a senior guide he said please explain how did the temple came he said it came because there was a king chalukyan king called amrithayya nayaka when they took on the the sultanate in a fight he was backstabbed and he died so the king who came there he was his general the king who came he said look this guy in a war which is supposed to be fought one to one people have stabbed in the back which is against the rule of war so this guy has to be made immortal so the king then and there decided to build a temple for his general amrithayya nayaka is name it became an amriteshwara for lord shiva the temple is still there so now when we take our child not only should we tell our child please worship lord shiva get a prasadam and come out no the intention of building the temple is not to give prasadam or to coconut or something the intention is for the father and mother to tell that child you are worshiping linga which is built in memory of a person who was killed in a war unfairly so never do unfair things in life so all those temples are built to give a lesson to the society so that is why all temples and many things in our life are built ma'am but we are in a so hurry and we go there and except books like this come everything you perfectly document lalita ditya the beautiful sun temple people first time i heard about this in the kashmir yes. files movie till then none of us in india yes. heard a name called lalita ditya 7th century and the temple got raised and disturbed and none of us knew many of us don't know ma'am maybe some of the audience could have known i didn't know that you built the sun temple only the name i could hear in the history so the history is right in front of us right in front of us everywhere we walk it is there in chennai when we walk this is the place which gave inspiration to mahatma gandhi in 1917 for non cooperation movement he came he was sleeping at morning 435 between the dawn was when the dusk was coming dawn dusk 
that is the time he got that vague thing non cooperation moment started madurai when he went he left all his clothes but only thing is our eyes and ears are not tuned and open to the history around us this country everything is history madam everything is history you walk there is a history light in front of you and somehow we want this kind of books to come and develop an interest and that is where i feel very bad madam how many of us have the time now to tell the younger generation look learn from it because this whole temple or structure or something magnificent is standing here for 1000 years because not for you to appreciate the beauty clap and go it is there to convey a story that story could be a story of courage story of sacrifice some story so that is where this kind of books play a part and i hope and pray this will rekindle that interest in history madam rekindle that history interest great things history is not to be learned to mug up and and vomit in the uh, exam so that you get good marks history is there because you see your true self in the mirror you get inspired you become a great personality you come out and do it that is why the writing the narration of the book itself is very different not like a temple you 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 thrown all around it very beautifully rajendra chola how did you take madam very beautifully as if you are traveling in a ship as if you are traveling in the sea as if you are seeing what is happening there in cambodia as if you are seeing everything out so it should inspire the young kids but not necessarily per se by reading but this book will take many forms for that i think this is just a base yes. i believe madam thank you and it's uh, definitely a good uh, very useful tool a good place to start to um, to to, uh, to work with our children and inculcate a sense of pride in uh, our great uh, heritage but having said that uh, mr namle when a book like this is written there's always people who don't like the existing narrative to be disturbed any expansion of the narrative any tweaking of anything anything that might alter your perceptions or you know sometimes it reopens old wounds you want to settle the scores of a past somebody invaded my country so i have to fix that guy now will it you know lead to that kind of a response the great thing now ma'am uh, the information is very democratized now so anything you read uh, that to very heavily research book the references are too many 20 30 40 references aram se is given so now when you read it when there is a debatable point somebody debates with them uh, you mentioned about uh, the grand temple the tanjavur temple this that it is not like this it is that now all we need to do is go through the references go through the historical different inputs that is available in the open source internet and whatever it is but these are all not necessarily available per se it lot of deep historical research has got it but to argue on a point or to check a fact now for him technology helps because now we say this era is the era of vikram sambat era of sai deepak era of three four eminent historians that too they are very young and he is very deadly also an engineer <laughs> then an mba trained in music uh, music is also science from end of yes. the day it, Uh, high highest science so he has got all the quality now it is like debating with the mathematician of the highest order mm-hmm. now i am sure he is he is seeing history in numbers he is just mm-hmm. arguing in numbers so they are very deadly people madam not like some age old person sitting somewhere read mm-hmm. some book writing some story the young generation are becoming very deadly so that is why people try taking them on in the initial phase now they are keeping quiet they know what material they are made up of mm-hmm. so i think the the era has changed the nature of information flow has changed uh, the book will pass through a state of least resistance that was what i see madam thank you yes. and some t- <laughs> and sometimes mr annamle people uh, argue without having done any research without understanding uh, uh, without getting the facts uh, correct they just argue for the sake of arguing like recently when pony in selvan was uh, released based on kalki krishnamurthy's uh, work uh, mani ratnam directed film there was a totally unnecessary debate of, about whether raja raja soran was a hindu so uh, somebody has built uh, shiva temples he also supported vishnu and other temples and you say you debate whether he is a hindu or not because the word hindu wasn't coined at uh, at that point as dr karan singh pointed out uh, very aptly he said it's like saying you're a catholic without being a christian so uh, these kind of i think th- why do politicians have to pay, play caste oh, politics there's something i was uh, coming to 
politicians uh, we stand guilty as charged the reason is madam uh, plato expected the political politics to be the highest of science highest highly evolved science should be the political science that is what the greek philosophers wanted but uh, uh, churchill said politics has become the last page of uh, scoundrels now it has changed in about we have changed from the greek era to now i see you you see the scholars you look at the first constituent assembly after 52 when they all went and sat you are this high quality people sitting inside great debates great quality constitutional assembly debates 46 to 49 now we have political leaders in tamil nadu a big mp is now 3 4 5 time mp in a question they are asking about gst he's like acha gst is like that without even knowing he was speaking about gst for the last 4 years we have politicians of that nature i'm not taking anybody's name not to make it very political in nature people have studied very less very little knowledge they don't have a sense of history they're extremely small minded very polarized views they take and uh, they come and debate in the public they get exposed thoroughly <laughs> they exposed thoroughly so this are all very amateurish comment made by one curse one person who picked up because unfortunately the tamil media is no more the age old scrutiny media they are the highest standard they hold people to account now the tamil media if you look at the night time debate is raja raja cholan a hindu they have taken that as a debate point and four guys sitting in one side and saying no what is a hindu who coined the word called hindu another debate and other person is no 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 he said in this context i feel very sad seeing the quality of intellectual discussion that is happening in tamil society right now ma'am i feel very sad the quality of debate we do this land has given the highest quality of people some of the greatest musicians are here greatest writers are here kalki would have felt very sad from up seeing what is happening what has it come to in tamil nadu what are you doing so after the movie has come then you must have seen the other side of debate why did maniratha make an hindutva movie <laughs> suddenly why did he become a sanghi this are all the same debate that got flipped to 180 degree because people commented whether rajaraja chalan was a hindu only after seeing the trailer i remember one political commentator felt after seeing the movie the movie got released later he said the movie has got too much hinduness in it <laughs> now you have to ask him please explain hinduness to me very unfortunate the quality of debate is getting very childish very amateurish i hope and pray good people they get into politics that is very important ma'am politics in the day is scholarly that's why rajya sabha was created because you want scholarly people to sit inside who might not necessarily get elected we cannot ask vikram sambhat ji to get go go to bangalore uh, don't write anything that is why intentionally the president of india has given 12 seats in rajya sabha and president of india should nominate people like them people of letters people of eminent historians people of sports nature and 12 people should come into rajya sabha sit there now i felt very happy in the last rajya sabha nomination you see ma'am even before that that post was also sold for a suitcase now you had highest quality like people like ilai raja entering people like pt usha entering rajamouli ji's uh, father who wrote most of the screen plays for some of the best movies is entering people of literature sports and music so this makes the discussion very healthy and the po- political parties are also expected to nominate their rajya sabha candidates of that quality and lok sabha it is expected over a point of time among the 543 at least 150 200 would have some kind of a brain and, and rationality when they debate <laughs> not necessarily people play a caste card not necessarily people play a regional card not necessarily people play that aryan dravidian card hindu tamil card sanskrit this card that card anti brahmin card of course in a politics there is a space and some people sneak through it like 50 60 people come when all 543 become like that imagine the danger for the democracy <laughs> when all 39 from tamil nadu become like that image in the danger for our democracy so though there is a check and balance i hope and pray it gets corrected over a point of time where the intellectual people come in and possibly the the democracy also becomes conducive for them to get elected that is very important when gujarat kind of bjp wave happens i feel very happy in a wave election it is always easy to push some 10 10 20 intellectual candidates inside in a wave election there is always the mla because bjp won about 90% of seats it contested today in gujarat so it is great for democracy in a way because not everybody need to be a rabble rouser i will do this i will give you free thing i will give you th- so this kind of sweep election you push some 10 25 candidates who will make the democracy mature that makes political parties great 
so when you want the intellectual guys to come inside do normal politics go from street to street meet people you can understand my modi ji if you look at our or some of the greatest cabinet ministers railway minister nirmala sitaraman commerce and industry piyush goel ji external affairs minister jay shankar petroleum hardeep singh puri you can't expect all five ministers to be in their constituency daily meet people from morning 9 to 4 o'clock and then do poor things like a normal politician then their question of getting elected becomes problem that is why modi ji felt this issues bring a professional bring nirmala sitaraman to finance is a professional bring peesh goel ji because he is a professional because these are all countries these are all issues a professional has to be free of democratic pressure which marriage should i attend which thing should i go my district president is there which mala should i put to him which mala he should put to me which house we should go because for a normal politician this takes 80% of our time because you miss a marriage 100 votes gone <laughs> you miss a death ceremony 50 votes gone you you invitation has come somehow you fail to turn up 1000 votes gone you don't smile in the public whichever mood you are there 5000 votes gone so that is why modi ji expects nirmala sitaraman ji peesh goel ji jay shankar ji hardeep singh puri ji to be the best of brains because they focus on administration at work that i think it happens in more I think that's a wonderful insight that you have provided uh, Mr Namle and that that probably is the way forward because many people although uh, we regularly hear uh, hear everybody saying that good people should enter good people should enter we know how difficult Very it difficult. is so I think what you say makes uh, eminent uh, sense and also tells us about the thinking of your uh, your party So I think can we have some rapid fire questions? Oh my God! Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, so Vikram, <laughs> do you do you uh, handwrite your draft? Do you type? Do you dictate? How do you do oh. it? No, I type now because I think it's. I was telling uh, Aruna Mami also. I think it's, we've lost touch with our uh, fingers and hands yeah. uh, <laughs> to sign also. Yes. I think uh, typing it just saves so much time in terms of editing and all of that. So yeah. And how long did the book take from start to finish? This took about two years. Okay. Uh, yeah, two years. The Savarkar volumes took about five years okay. of uh, a lot of <laughs> uh, research. Uh, this was uh, in that way. Penguin was right. It was a comparatively a quickie. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Anamle, uh, you uh, you talked about having to attend weddings and you know uh, <laughs> and smiling at people and uh, deciding on the garlands and stuff like that. I'm sure with all that how do you manage to read how do you do you speed read uh, what is the secret I'm sure you have lots to Very read. tough madam uh, because uh, as we speak now I come from Karur and Karur I have all my relatives in Karur and Kongu area So a wedding season some days the invitation goes up to 30 Okay uh, but I am the my current role makes me to be in Chennai and I have to be here if I don't go there people think I've I've lost touch with that soil and somewhere I'm roaming So for me it is a family work it gets divided my wife 1 2 3 4 5 you go my sister 4 5 6 7 8 you go my mother this 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 you go my father this 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 is you go delegation all delegation complete delegation man <laughs> and everywhere i go they they go there they make a phone and they say and you talk in phone i say i cannot come i'm so sorry next time when i come home uh, the current political climate and role in india madam is very very complicated extremely complicated we work 24 by 7 365 days the age old happiness of taking a book and reading it cover to cover at one session because you you feel it college time and all when you read a book you feel it now this book was with me in varanasi it was with me in delhi it was traveling with me last 6 days here and there yesterday was what with me in coimbatore and i was like open it see it uh, next chapter I, the joy is missing madam because i want this kind of beautiful book to read it in one go you take it at one go because that is the justice you do to a great author like him but here it is like so much distraction diversion uh, when shashitharur says i have read so many books after becoming a politician i really don't know uh, <laughs> maybe tarur can read it but before becoming getting into politics we have read so much but now it is becoming impossible day by day 
and uh, at the same time when uh, to honor we have to read and come because you have to do justice to this book so it's very tough madam not very easy maybe from the outside it looks oh they are very well organized and here here and everything is there not very easy madam so like they say it takes a village to bring a child for me it takes a family and a big parivar to make me to do what i am doing so alone it is impossible madam what about a book after stepping in kaki Yes, madam. Uh, we haven't made an announcement, but uh, second book I'm campaigning with Aravind Neela Gandanji. So both of us have uh, decided to write a book. It is called. Uh, we have to make an announcement, madam. Uh, we are just in the process of uh, building it together. We are calling it Tamil Nadu 2.0, mm. and uh, we are taking a complete unbiased relook at uh, what Tamil Nadu has gone in the last eight years, the Davidian philosophy, and. the development actually happen the development happened because of philosophy or because of people or because of eminent entrepreneurs who did the development and uh, where is tamil nadu now in the indian uh, sphere and where tamil nadu has to go from now so it's a it's a book both of us have combinedly decided we have to write it it's a need of the hour and uh, probably next year mid we should come out yes madam and what about uh, how often do you go to your farm very important question <laughs> um recently i read my resignation letter madam when the ips when i got out i read that very beautiful letter i wrote very emotional letter in the letter i wrote and i wanted to spend time with my son and my farm and i want to see whether my sheep still listens to me because i'm no more a cop i've written now after resigning i want to do this peacefully beautifully i wanted to dedicate time but forces took me into politics i was in for running a foundation then somehow i am sitting in front of you in a new role so the current time i get is hardly 2 to 3 days every month to enter into my farm see what is happening and come out every time i go i tell my mother uh, why I, last time i was asking we we got a jallikattu bull which is supposed to go from this january so i told my mother amma enna ivlo perusa irche jallikattu kaalane ivlo perusa irche na saapad adhigama vekringla because we don't want it to put lot of fat because it has to go on to it My mother told me, "I don't know. Every month, 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 some of the karma is keeping me here uh, i'm technically not a chennai boy you all know because chennai i never came i i came during the school time once college time once uh, the first time when i became the when i joined the party i came to ten, chennai after 10 years i was like what happened to chennai everything is changed now karma has made sure that i am staying in chennai so i am properly a village boy i feel out of place in a crowd i feel out of place with the cars i feel out of place in a big crowd by nature i am kind of a Uh, shy boy uh, I, for me two people is a big crowd but but politics has made sure i do exactly things opposite to how i was brought up uh, very tough one madam but i still hope and pray once the role is done once bjp comes to power then probably you seek what uh, shivaji sought you seek what uh, the great people did you take refuge in your mind you take refuge in the soil you go there live a peace quite full quite life and you spend time with your child I want to be the biggest uh, uh, inspiration for him. I want to be the biggest teacher for him, for my daughter, because they look up to me. Uh, this things is like a karma. I do it with devotion. I do it with love. But you bring good people into power centers. That is my biggest aim. You identify good people, build the party, make sure right people sit in right position. But after that, I don't have any interest, madam. For me, the farm and the sheep and the cow it interests me more. I hope and pray maybe five, ten years from now I'll be there doing what I love. So last two questions for you Vikram how do you handle uh, criticism and when you're not writing what do you do <laughs> handle criticism i mean that comes <laughs> dime a dozen as uh, anna malai sir mentioned i think the flood gates got opened after the savarkar book i knew there would be a backlash but i didn't expect uh, it would be this vitriolic but it's i think expected i would be in a fool's paradise if i thought that you know 
uh, establishmentarians who have uh, you know ruled the roost for so long anyone coming from the outside and attacking a well guarded fortress um, you know they would have to face the kind of onslaughts the kind of uh, you know personal attacks a lot of other things i remember in 2008 my uh, first book uh, on mysore had come out and uh, in that tipu sultan and hyder ali were just one chapter and so somebody had invited me for a talk in bangalore uh, about that and uh, i was just quoting you know and i was still a young boy it was my first book i was not aware of how to navigate these difficult waters with so many crocodiles and sharks so uh, there was i was quoting some of his own letters where he talks of uh, conversions and attacks and all of those things and suddenly the the, the hall like this it just erupted and there were so many people who started throwing paper rockets and the uh, the this one had to be actually aborted the 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 talk and uh, the organizers took me away and then my father was sitting in the first row and somebody went to him and gave a, a you know pamphlet or some some tipu fan club or something and then said you have only one one child so better look after him if you want him around for long Uh, and that really rattled uh, him so much and he came back and he told my mother and my mother that day took an uh, uh, oath uh, you know saying you are not going to talk about tipu sultan ever in public uh, you know in uh, this thing and now that she is not there i broke that uh, oath and i'm now writing a full fledged biography of his i really don't know wherever she is i'm sure she'll uh, protect me from that so uh, i think you know, as annamalai sir said i think the when you are on a i look at it as a dharma yuddha where there will be attacks there will be all kinds of people saying all kinds of things uh, if you if you cannot face the uh, heat in the kitchen then leave the kitchen so but then uh, it it is a very important uh, field to be left away for uh, you know uh, agenda driven establishmentarians for so long more and more people should come in you must have i'm like he said i am also an extremely shy extremely introverted person who shudders at the very thought of public speaking and having so many people in front of you but then karma pushes you into strange waters all the time maybe uh, you know it's it's uh, some calling some blessing of somebody to to actually do something a small little uh, contribution to this country uh, and of course i would say on a lighter note that those writing history with a different uh, perspective should also have a good battery of lawyers uh, <laughs> considering these days i'm fighting more in the courts and having defamation suits and this and that so that costs a lot of money so <laughs> the lawyers also are very important to have i know uh, telling it like it is yeah so we've uh, uh, almost reached the end of the program and and uh, we'll field a few questions from the audience so please be very brief state your name um let the question be a question and not a long winded speech and uh, tell us who you would like uh, the, the response from the mics are coming round அது <laughs> 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 அது எப் எப்போ யார் ஆரம்பித்தா எந்த கோயில் அது ஃபஸ்ட்டு போனாங்க வி ஆர் ட்ரைன் டு இந்த என்னென்ன தியரி எல்லாம் பில்ட் பண்ணியிருக்காங்களோ சோஷியல் ஜஸ்டிஸ் தியரி இந்த தியரி அந்த தியரி என்னென்ன தியரி எல்லாம் பில்ட் பண்ணியிருக்காங்களோ எவ்ரி திங் வி ஆர் ஹேவிங் அ ரீ லுக் வித் ஹிஸ்ட்ரி வித் டாக்குமெண்ட்ஸ் மிகப்பெரிய ஃபஸ்ட்டு ஐ திங்க் டெம்பிள் என்ட்ரி மூமெண்ட் நமஸ்காரங்க ஐயா ரொம்ப நன்றி தேங்க் யூ Mm. I'd like to know from your research how true or false is the Thuyal story because there is a 
Yes, yes. No, that's an excellent point. I think it it is ex it is completely true that she helped uh, while she was escaping uh, to Mysore uh, and to the border area to actually later seek refuge with Hyder Ali. Uh, that is when she uh, when the the Arcot Nawab and the East India Company are in hot pursuit. It is she who helps uh, uh, you know uh, Velu Nachiar to escape safely, and that is one reason she names her uh, you know women's corpse also after her. And after the re-establishment of the uh, the kingdom in Shivaganga, uh, even the uh, the Mangal Sutra is uh, uh, kept in her honor uh, uh, there by Velu Nachiar. And uh, Kuili is also is a is a great story because you know uh, Shivaganga is under occupation uh, of the British and uh, uh, Arcot Nawab. And these people, all these women on a Vijay Dashmi day, they come to that uh, place and uh, dressed as devotees. And then they, the, it's completely the woman corpse who comes to the, uh, to the palace and the temple and ostensibly with the, uh, this thing to, 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 to worship on Vijay Dashmi. But in the middle of that, this Kuili goes to the uh, ammunition store. She douses herself with uh, you know, kerosene and then lights herself and then goes into the ammunition uh, center and the whole thing blows up. And uh, most of the weaponry of the British uh, is destroyed. And that is how then all the women pull out their uh, uh, you know, swords with uh, vetrivel, uh, you know, uh, slogans, yeah, and veeravel, and then go and then attack and uh, reoccupy. That is very much a documented uh, history, which uh, the the British records scantily mention, but uh, you know, it it is a part of uh, it's a true true history. Oh, I see. Any other questions? Can you, can you step up? Hello? No, I'm sure, sir. I mean, they, what about, there are many people who, uh, you know, one can write, as I said, these 15 are not the uh, be all and end all. This is just the start. Like, uh, you know, even on social media, so many people other than the other galis that one gets, they also, a lot of constructive suggestions about, you know, you missed, uh, like in this book, there is no representation in, to Odisha, to Bengal, to uh, maybe uh, Nagaland and so many other places. Somebody told me about this fascinating ruler whom I had never heard of. I uh, they later did a little digging about him called Langula Narasingha Deva, uh, you know, from Odisha, uh, apparently. And he is the one who built the Konark temple also, uh, 13th century and thereabouts. And uh, while all the other people mentioned in the book are more reactive, like when there were invasions, they reacted, they pushed back. Here was a man who was proactive. Even before the Turks and uh, all the Turkic armies could, and the Khiljis, the Delhi Sultanate could attack his uh, kingdom, he proactively ensured a pushback from the entire Odisha and Bengal region. And when someone uh, pointed this out on social media, I literally hit myself saying, what a, what a gem of a story that would have been, and I missed it. So I'm sure there are many such people, and uh, now, increasingly, the, uh, the pressures from, the, uh, from my readers, from the publisher, etc., is to bring out a sequel where maybe many of these people who are left behind can be included. Uh, no. Uh, Rajkumarji, thank you for the question. For me, more than a hero, uh, it is, I derive a lot of inspiration from many small things they did, many great things they did. If you look at historical figures per se, and uh, we live in an age and time uh, where we pick up things here and there. Um, first time when I went to, uh, recently when uh, uh, Himanta Dada, he celebrated uh, the 400th uh, birth birth and birth the celebration of Lachit, where Amit Shah ji went and uh, inaugurated. It was a full page paper, full front page paper. Across India, they have done it. I just saw, I, I never heard his name. In Delhi, they are celebrating. Amit Shah ji is coming and uh, doing the honors. Let me Google and see. Uh, because our sense of history is also limited by the place we live and the books we read and the kind of people we meet. But the more we kind of have the courage to push our boundaries, go see new people and new places, they also inspire us. 
So I, I would say, let, let me not limit myself by the kind of heroes I've seen with my limited life till now. But there are a lot of heroes waiting to be discovered more, somewhere hiding here and there. So for me, I take inspiration here, there and everybody. So that is why I said the Amritahalli, Amriteshwara, Amritaya Nayaka story is great story for me. Great story. Because the temple was just built to honor a general because the rules of the war were very clear. Don't fight after sunset, don't stab in the back. But they did it because somebody lost a son and somebody lost a husband and some child lost their father. The temple was built purely in memory of that person to keep his memory alive. For me, it's a great story. For me, more than the temple, I really loved the king who built the temple. Because how many kings would do that for a general? So that is a story I want to teach my child do it. Raja Raja Cholan, Raja Indra Cholan, of course. Uh, we read it now, we know what they are and somebody waited for their throne for very long. Somebody had the patience to come, especially Raja Raja Cholan. Then Raja Indra Cholan was more on, a, more on a plate. But we see about dynasties now. Rajendra Cholan, nobody would say that is a dynastic succession. Now, dynastic succession is a very bad word in politics now. Oh, dynastic succession, you are bad. But this Rajendra Cholan, he went one up than his father. He went one up. So, this is a classic case of a, of a son learning from his father, father giving him uh, uh, the, the exposure in battlefield and grooming him as a proper general, a warrior king, then a great emperor who had the audacity to push oceans and go there. So I take inspiration, okay, we should bring our son like that. Put him in hard places, make him to get exposed to, to unruly things and don't give him the, a, comf a kind of comfort that many kings have given to their son. Mughals got destroyed because each successive generation were, were given more comforts than the previous generation. And these are all stories I pick from there. Though I see a great man, but as a father I see, what do I pick from this great thing so that my son shouldn't get spoiled. And this is how I see history. Uh, as a father, sometimes I see, sometimes as a politician, I see a lot of statecraft. How did they handle this? What, what techniques they used? Uh, because for you, the, the enemies are within, enemies are from outside. How do you tactfully manage? So this I see as a politician. And as a father, you see history in a different way. As a politician, you see. As a common man, you see. So the inspirations are too many, sir. Thank you so much. Including your book was an inspiration. Last time when we released it. Uh. Uh, namaskaram sir. My question is to Anna Malayana. Anna Namaskaram na. Uh, now after 20-25 years, can we see you as the next PM of India? <laughs> Someone from Tamil Nadu after a long time. Uh, sister, the way I live my life is very simple, sister. Uh, I live my life on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, frankly speaking, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, because the kind of people you take on, the kind of forces you take on, the kind of things you do, because the ecosystem itself is like, there are thousands of people waiting in Tamil Nadu right now because I, I, I speak something bad, I speak something wrong, I quote something wrong in history, I mention a date wrong. Yeah, there are thousands of people waiting in Facebook, in social media, somebody in TV, oh no, 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 he... So, it is always for me, it is like I live my life, I can choose to live my life like standing on a knife's edge and walking, but I chose to live my life like a recluse. Meaning there is nothing more to lose, there is nothing more to gain also. Look at the larger dharmic picture. Go there, completely surrender yourself and do things the way your heart is telling you to do. And wherever this takes you, wherever this takes you, I never wanted to be a politician, never. I hated getting into politics because I've seen politics very close. Ten years as a cop, in my book I've written the what kind of politicians have dealt, the underhand things they do. And for me, politics is strict no-no. Strict no. When I resigned also, my wife purposefully asked me, are you sure you will not get into politics? I said, no. Uh, I want to run a foundation, I want to get into grassroots. And then uh, when, 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 when things forced me to get into politics also, then she asked me, okay, you will use your intellectual stuff in politics, you will come on TV, you will speak, you will do that only, you will not go to ground, no? I said, no, I will not do that. <laughs> then again, things brought me here. It is like daily firefighting, hitting, going there, somebody abusing me, all those things. Whenever I go, my mother is a very simple woman sister. She is, uh, my mother is my is sixth class, sixth class pass proper village. Uh, my mother has never come to Chennai. Though I am asking her to come to Chennai to see me, she has never come to Chennai. And all her life she has lived among the goats, the sheep, and the cows. 
maximum she has ventured as right now she ventures more but maybe till the age of 45 50 she has ventured about 50 km now my mother's universe is getting affected because i am in politics she gets to see this youtube and then when i go there she like why did this fellow speak bad about you i am like which fellow no no that fellow with big mustache in that thing i have seen it and why did this fellow read something about you she is not into this facebook and twitter and all she is into this whatsapp whatever this 2 minute 1 minute forward she gets she gets very disturbed i go there i sit with her i tell her no no this is politics i told you not to see it not to read good things about me not to read bad things about me you should not read it for the time being then i call my sister and tell her why why is she watching all this who who's who is her friend who is forwarding <laughs> now the problem is in my village all the grandmas have become my friends now it is they do the biggest forward in social media i am like election time i have seen again i go i said party why are you doing as thambi or two minutes whatsapp la vandhuchu pa idukave peram katta solli whatsapp download panni 10 perthukku anupradhu now their whole universe is affected it's a simple quiet life political attacks on me my, my mother is worried what is he going to say so i can't live a life with big ambition sister it has to be a total surrender to a larger cause total surrender to the panchabhuta that is the only way else i go mad the kind of things i am forced to see i go mad and i just train my mind see that don't allow any things you you sometimes you happen to stand in a crowd of 50000 60000 70000 people clap cheering for me it's a question of front 10 people my mind only sees the front 10 next day i happen to see in we be in a crowd of only 100 people again i see the first 10 and when people abuse me also when people praise me also i chose to see what i want to see so this life is a very curtailed life if i only a life based on dharma if i skip dharma then it's a problem for me so ambitions whatever has to happen if dharma wants you to be at some place for me at, i said in the heart give now i probably i leave everything go back and uh, be in my farm happily so for me i always held that moral dilemma am i doing something right should i go through all this process but till i read shivaji i have i happened to read shivaji very late at the age of 35 i am 38 now 35 36 i happened to read shivaji very very deeply that i found shivaji also had a, such a great emperor had the same problem he wanted to leave everything through everything surrender everything wanted to give his land and kingdom to somebody go there live a very normal peaceful life that is where he goes and meets his guru and the guru tells no 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 you are not made for this this is your larger karma you got to go you got to take on mughals you got to fight multiple battles you take on mughals coming from north then there are the adil shahs who are right next to you there are the shah dynasty there you fight multiple battle because He, you are you imagine ma'am from 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 a no land from a no land he never had a land of his own though his father was gifted something else it's a different story from no land this guy truly created an empire and probably the first mega hindu empire but everything he did because his guru told him total surrender and his mom again when he went and met his mom he said i am not doing it then mom only thing she asked is look at 10000 people behind you look at people who are standing behind you everybody is standing because they believe in you they want you to lead them suddenly at uh, 21 27 you come you get this fancy ideas you come and say i want to sacrifice everything and live this life of a mendicant then what are you going to tell them it's a very beautiful story but 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 in the hurriness of history reading we don't read this and once shivaji dedicated himself that i'm going to totally surrender then magic happened because the fear of failure is gone He, he he didn't have anything to prove to anybody for him it's a daily life living on dharma wherever life took him it took him so for me that is all very big questions i am not cut out for it not fit for it just do this process right get good people into politics inspire kids make people of virtuous quality to come to power who are sitting in power make sure we build that thing virtuous quality people who became an mla in our party also should have that virtuous quality even they are becoming a counselor should have that virtuous quality somebody becoming cm from our party should have that virtuous same when when we trace back to narendra modi ji's life he also had the same problem that is why i i i i create i equated martanda varman to to shivaji narendra modi ji 1950 born 
19 he came out of his house he went to rss shaka told his father again roamed around india came back to his mother stayed for one night ate food told his mother i'm leaving that's it i'm done i'm going to join rss then again rss he was not sure whether he is doing the right thing i'm dedicating myself to an organization to a larger cause went to ramakrishna mission not once twice both the time he told the ramakrishna mission i am leaving everything i'm coming and joining this mission as a monk except both the times the same monk a senior monk told him no your karma is different you got to go back join the organization face the internal politics take on everybody life has somehow created something for you age of 35 which is 1985 bjp wanted somebody from the rss he was deputed from rss to bjp 95 he went in started building the party 97 the whole gujarat bjp did not want narendra modi in gujarat that's a record that's a fact they didn't want narendra modi ji to be in gujarat 97 he came out of gujarat the 2001 the same land wanted him to come back as chief minister of gujarat now rest is history we are looking at 156 160 80% it is all built by one man who chose to sacrifice surrender to a larger cause we are enjoying the fruits of benefit now the party is enjoying his sacrifice his fruits of benefit so you see this great people madam somehow they actually don't want to do what they are doing not i am calling vikram as great not i am calling sudha madam as great they are very normal simple people all of us are but it is let us surrender ourselves to life nature and nature knows where it has to take you and where it takes you wherever it takes you it wants you to be completely switch the cycle and want you to live a normal life that's your karma you have to live it or it want to live in the highest of palace shaking hands with the greatest of american presidents if that is karma for you you have to do it because you are not doing it for enjoyment you are doing it for karma because karma wants you to be there because you serve a larger purpose i am not sure whether i answered your question exactly but, but this is how i think it madam this is how i think it and this is how i live it thank you we have time only for one question so just now you you said uh, you wanted to be a very free sleep uh, in the in the farm uh, so after after identifying the right talent people how are you going to identify that right uh, uh, talented people for the next generation of uh, your party it's not a very easy question sir now let us imagine somebody wants to join my party let us imagine my party bjp right now Uh, you are a young man with a lot of achievements you are considering bjp as a potential party for you now the what are the questions in front of you please sir what are the questions in front of you because what about the winability of the party will i join the party in the first attempt am i going to win elections and uh, is tamil nadu conducive for bjp these are the questions you have but if you look at the other party somebody is only looking at power maybe i will come the symbol has got more value it has got more votes the chances of me winning is very high in that party so now bjp wants a certain set of people now who will put sacrifice as the fundamental nature of their human personality because here right now the symbol value of bjp is not 35% vote share in tamil nadu the symbol value of of bjp in gujarat is 54% because narendra modi ji chose at one point of time to do all the heavy lifting 95 to 1985 to 94 as organizing secretary general secretary all in the organizing secretary then 2001 as chief minister because now the symbol value is less but the first quality i'm looking at somebody is can you sacrifice yourself in the process you might not get anything in the next 20 years you might not get anything you might lose multiple elections but still all we need for dhamik revival in tamil nadu is one time you have to bring bjp to power that's it one time people should see that one cycle but for that one cycle to happen it is generations that has to put their heart and soul generations have to put so we are looking at that kind of people who are selfless not expecting anything totally surrender whenever it happens it happens at least i am not benefiting my future generations will benefit so that is the main quality we are looking now i hope and pray a lot of people are on that similar mindset
Thank you, sir. To Anna Malay, sir. Uh, tonight I'm leaving for Karur, and it gives me happiness that it is your place of birth. I'm leaving for Karur because I'm trying to bring two main pillars of Indian civilization, which is Bharatanatyam and Bhagavad Gita together, to bring the essence chapter-wise. And I feel that's my calling. It's not just for me, but that every educational and cultural institutions across the world should have this form of teaching. So for an artist like me, who loves our culture, what suggestion would you have to bring all these, uh, this dimension of learning, the spiritual aspect, as well as the art and culture in various ed education institutions? Uh, to your question, uh, Pavitraji, that, uh, you know, I was that boy who never liked history as it was taught, as I mentioned. But then, as he mentioned, I think there's some forces at play which determine your destiny. There was, I don't know how many of you remember, there was a serial those days on Doordarshan called Sword of Tipu Sultan uh, by Sanjay Khan. And I think if I have to credit someone for my literary career, it is Sanjay Khan, uh, though <laughs> quite uh, unexpectedly. So there, if you remember, the Maharaja of Mysore was shown, the Vodiyar was shown as this obese, you know, retard who was dancing with the court dancer. Then the Maharani was one of those typical, you know, Ekta Kapoor serial vamps who are all the time conspiring and uh, conniving and so on. So, uh, somewhere, you know, they were, and there were lots of protests in different parts of Karnataka, uh, you know, about this. And these were spontaneous, apolitical, not led by any political party, because even to this day, after 75 years of the, uh, you know, independence and the uh, so-called, so uh, you know, extinction of the royal family, the royal family of Mysore was one of the most progressive, uh, you know, rulers uh, that the nation has seen, along with what, Travancore and other uh, kingdoms, which did so much. I mean, all the firsts that Karnataka had to its credit was thanks to the uh, benevolent Maharajas of Mysore, their divans like uh, Sar Sarim Vishweshwaraya, Mirza Ismail, and so many others. And today, if Southern Karnataka is a powerhouse, economic, uh, you know, growth house, and also a cultural melting pot. It was an osmosis of all cultures, Hindustani music, Carnatic music, Western music, different dance forms, all of that being patronized. Uh, it was thanks to them. And, uh, you know, even when the last Maharaja of the dynasty passed away uh, a few years ago, the entire city of Mysore just shut down voluntarily. Nobody asked them to or it was not a uh, hartal given by anybody or anything. So somewhere they, that apple cart had been upset and even my parents who didn't know much about Mysore history or something, they said, how could they show Krishnaraj Vadiyar in this manner and so on. So as a child who was seeing this, I was quite, uh, you know, uh, disturbed and I said, I really need to know the truth behind this false representation. And from then on, at the age of 12 or 13, began a series of uh, journeys to Mysore. I really really don't know. I have no connection to Mysore. Otherwise, it is some prarabdha that takes you there, I think. And for the next 10 years, even while I was writing uh, my, uh, you know, entrance exam, my board exam, the JE, Bitspilani, all these things, this Mysore bug was with me all the time. Every vacation meant troubling my parents to take me to this uh, place, seeing, uh, meeting the palace, uh, you know, um, archivists, historians, members of the royal family. Never, uh, you know, with the intention that I will write a book, it will become a bestseller it will do this and that. Like today, I think a lot of authors, they plan their career. Whereas here it was serendipity and as he said, surrender to a larger cause that is taking you on a path. Uh, and then over the 10 years, I had the interest magnified beyond that one king and queen to the entire dynasty. Like the Ahoms I mentioned, the Vodiyars also ruled for 600 years, uh, from 1399 to 1947. And so many, uh, you know, credits, uh, um, uh, first to their credit. But when I saw that there was no book written on them at all uh, in the modern times, the first initial comments that I said about how our historiography is so skewed, where South India is, uh, doesn't feature, uh, the Vodiyars in the larger national narrative, nobody probably even knows who they are. So there was this quote of Toni Morrison, the Nobel laureate, who said, if there is a book that you want to read and it has not been written yet, you must be the first one to write it. So I think there was this need for writing this book on the Vodiyars and the Mysore kings and that's how after 10 years of research which was uh, which was Swanta Sukhaya, it was not with any agenda, which was not with any kind of uh, this thing but when, once you do that surrender, 
life took me on a completely different path. I was stuck in a boring corporate job, sitting at Excel sheets and thinking, what am I doing with my life? Am I just looking at, uh, you know, uh, profits for an American company and then one day I will just drop down dead. But then uh, one led to the other and, you know, while I was researching on the Mysore Vodiyars, I came across this mention of this wonderful artist there called Gauhar Jan, uh, who was a visiting musician who died there uh, in 1930. She lived there for two years. She was the first gramophone celebrity of this country, uh, you know, who uh, recorded her voice when gramophone technology came to India in 1902, uh, her story somehow, you know, immediately captivated my mind. Again, I don't know. So, so I think that humility that comes with it, that you are not doing anything. Somebody is just guiding you through this path. And at that instant, uh, I said, I'm going to uh, research about this lady. Now, here was a lady who was a courtesan, a tawaif from Calcutta. No legal heirs, no uh, successors, no students, no family, nothing. And I have no clue how to go about it. It was literally like looking for a needle in a haystack, uh, you know, looking for her story. But then I chased her literally through the length and breadth of India the next four years, like a literal, you know, Sherlock Holmes journey. Went to Azamgarh, Banaras, Darbhanga, Rampur, Calcutta, uh, then Mysore, Madras, uh, Bombay, London, Par uh, you know, even uh, Germany, Berlin, where the recording agent came from. And it was like, you're, you're consumed by that madness that I have to get this story out. And fragments start showing up when you, uh, when I think you uh, put in the effort, the universe also somewhere conspires to show you the path. And uh, again, nothing that you do, you're just uh, allowing things to happen and just be available to the existence to do that. And then that book really changed my life. That was the one that got me all these awards. It got me, uh, you know, on the path of setting this archive of Indian music and so on. It, and when I just went to give a talk about something like this in Australia, they said, you have done so much work. Why don't you do a PhD? So one thing led to the other. And then that gave me the confidence to throw away the job that I had, which was sapping my soul somewhere, uh, to actually have the courage to take up what I love, uh, which was history, which was writing. Uh, and so that's how this journey very, very serendipitously, uh, as they say, uh, you know, progressed. Wow. <laughs> Madam, uh, we have some of our Chennai's uh, finest, finest uh, vocalist, finest uh, violinist sitting here in front of us, including you. Aruna Saira, Madam, is there. Ganesh Rajagopalanji is there. The famous Ranjani Gayatri sisters are here. So your brother, to answer your question, ma'am, his his brother was my flat neighboring neighboring uh, person in the same flat. The day we were going to search for a flat, I asked that person who is staying here. He said uh, Kumaresh ji is staying, famous violinist. Then I told my wife, it's a double bonus. We get a flat next to Kumaresh ji. Whenever they play violin, we get to hear it also in the <laughs> morning. And. Uh, Madam used to conduct classes for uh, students and all. So we, we get that free concert. Uh, in the apartment, we request them to do free concerts for them. The reason I'm telling you this, Madam, I firmly believe every person should grow with music. They should grow with it. They should be surrounded by music. It somehow wires your neural network the right way. It somehow makes sure your mind develops in a very, very good spirit. But now, some of the best schools where they, they are asking us for recommendation for admissions, they come to our office, they read letters. Those schools have got music as a curriculum. They got drama as a curriculum, literature as a curriculum, those schools. Now, the concept of schools, one seat, some 200 people are applying. Now, many a time when they see that letter before I recommend, only thing is I stop myself. So, what if I recommend to this guy, there is a government school student somewhere, maybe the same talent and pedigree, he or she doesn't have the exposure to music. The greatest disservice that we as a nation have done is in the field of education. That we haven't exposed our children to music. Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade in government school, hire teachers, teach them music. Thereby make sure they become better, good individuals. I think that is the need of the hour, madam. We are also developing as a nation. We are about $3.1 trillion now. So in a matter of three years, we are going to hit $5 trillion, meaning, meaning we are going to overtake uh, Germany and Japan. We will become the third largest economy. So 2030, we are going to hit $8 trillion economy. So there is America, there is China, there is India. 
after 2030 it is going to be a three horse race then possibly we should overtake china maybe by 2047 45 we should we are somewhere there because china is too big as of now it's already 13 trillion dollar now with economic prosperity also the arts thrive for all countries where arts have thrived first came the economic prosperity then followed the attention for fine arts and music and everything so i hope and pray nothing is lost madam i know many of you you perform for the joy of it people here perform at the greatest of stages in the biggest of arenas uh, in the greatest of places they do but not for money not for fame i think you all have transcended that you have surrendered to a to a larger cause that is why nature is making you to your voice is entertaining thousands crores of people so many of you are doing this with uh, some of a noble thing in mind there comes a time the whole of india would would learn it the whole of india would speak in the language of music i think the time is coming the more prosperity is coming our way then naturally with we are progressing as a nation that is above middle class then the music will start entering everywhere so that's how i see it ma'am till then we just have to go through that grind for that madam cannot stop bharatanatyam madam cannot stop bhagavad gita even if karur my hometown tomorrow i hope a great attendance comes the land of karur or which built the great uh, magnificent uh, the tanjur temple the big temple that he wrote for raja raja cholan it was designed and the concept was given by the saint called karur or and karur so he went he gave the initial design and karur or samadhi is in karur so a lot of noble great people live in karur they have lived in karur so tomorrow audience for you doesn't matter it doesn't matter you are you are performing for the sake of art and the soil is breathing it is all observing it will explode any moment it's a matter of 30 40 years india will reclaim its old glory back it's a matter of matter of time that's all thank you